Carl Jung, Carl Gustav Jung Yuan, born Carl Gustav Jung, German, Carl J. Yuan G, 26 July 1875, 6 June 1961, was a Swiss psychiatrist and psychoanalyst who founded analytical psychology. Jung's work has been influential in the fields of psychiatry, anthropology, archaeology, literature, philosophy, psychology, and religious studies. Jung worked as a research scientist at the famous Burgholzli Hospital under Eugen Bleuler. During this time, he came to the attention of Sigmund Freud, the founder of psychoanalysis. The two men conducted a lengthy correspondence and collaborated for a while on a joint vision of human psychology. Freud saw the younger Jung as the heir he had been seeking to take forward his new science of psychoanalysis and to this end secured his appointment as president of his newly founded International Psychoanalytical Association. Jung's research and personal vision, however, made it impossible for him to follow his older colleague's doctrine and a schism became inevitable. This division was personally painful for Jung and resulted in the establishment of Jung's analytical psychology as a comprehensive system separate from psychoanalysis. Among the central concepts of analytical psychology is individuation, the lifelong psychological process of differentiation of the self out of each individual's conscious and unconscious elements. Jung considered it to be the main task of human development. He created some of the best known psychological concepts, including synchronicity, archetypal phenomena, the collective unconscious, the psychological complex, and extroversion and introversion. Jung was also an artist, craftsman, builder, and a prolific writer. Many of his works were not published until after his death and some are still awaiting publication. Biography Early Years Childhood Carl Gustav Jung was born 26 July 1875 in Keswil, in the Swiss canton of Thurgau, the first surviving son of Paul Achilles, Jung 1842-1896, and Emily Pracework 1848-1923. His birth was preceded by two stillbirths and the birth of a son named Paul, born in 1873, who survived only a few days. Paul Jung, Carl's father, was the youngest son of noted German-Swiss professor of medicine at Basel, Carl Gustav Jung 1794-1864. Paul's hopes of achieving a fortune never materialized, and he did not progress beyond the status of an impoverished rural pastor in the Swiss Reformed Church. Emily Pracework, Carl's mother, had also grown up in a large family whose Swiss roots went back five centuries. Emily was the youngest child of a distinguished Basel churchman and academic, Samuel Pracework, 1799-1871, and his second wife. Samuel Pracework was an antistes, the title given to the head of the reformed clergy in the city, as well as a Hebraist author and editor who taught Paul Jung as his professor of Hebrew at Basel University. In 1719 Jung's father was appointed to a more prosperous parish in Laufen when Jung was six years old. At this time, tensions between father and mother had developed. Jung's mother was an eccentric and depressed woman, she spent considerable time in her bedroom, where she said that spirits visited her at night. Although she was normal during the day, Jung recalled that at night his mother became strange and mysterious. He reported that one night he saw a faintly luminous and indefinite figure coming from her room with a head detached from the neck and floating in the air in front of the body. Jung had a better relationship with his father. Jung's mother left Laufen for several months of hospitalization near Basel for an unknown physical ailment. His father took the boy to be cared for by Emily Jung's unmarried sister in Basel, but he was later brought back to his father's residence. Emily Jung's continuing bouts of absence and depression deeply troubled her son and caused him to associate women with innate unreliability, whereas father meant for him reliability, but also powerlessness. In his memoir, Jung would remark that this parental influence was the handicap I started off with. Later, these early impressions were revised. I have trusted men friends and been disappointed by them, and I have mistrusted women and was not disappointed. After three years of living in Laufen, 
Old Jung requested a transfer. In 1879, he was called to Klein Huningen, next to Basel, where his family lived in a parsonage of the church. The relocation brought Emily Jung closer into contact with her family and lifted her melancholy. When he was nine years old, Jung's sister Johanna Gertrude, 1884-1935, was born. Known in the family as Trudy, she later became a secretary to her brother. 349. Memories of Childhood Jung was a solitary and introverted child. From childhood, he believed that, like his mother, he had two personalities, a modern Swiss citizen and a personality more suited to the 18th century. Personality number one, as he termed it, was a typical schoolboy living in the era of the time. Personality number two was a dignified, authoritative, and influential man from the past. Although Jung was close to both parents, he was disappointed by his father's academic approach to faith. Some childhood memories made lifelong impressions on him. As a boy, he carved a tiny mannequin into the end of the wooden ruler from his pencil case and placed it inside the case. He added a stone which he had painted into upper and lower halves and hid the case in the attic. Periodically, he would return to the mannequin, often bringing tiny sheets of paper with messages inscribed on them in his own secret language. He later reflected that this ceremonial act brought him a feeling of inner peace and security. Years later, he discovered similarities between his personal experience and the practices associated with totems in indigenous cultures, such as the collection of soul stones near Arlesheim or the Tijarangas of Australia. He concluded that his intuitive ceremonial act was an unconscious ritual, which he had practiced in a way that was strikingly similar to those in distant locations which he, as a young boy, knew nothing about. His observations about symbols, archetypes, and the collective unconscious were inspired, in part, by these early experiences combined with his later research. At the age of 12, shortly before the end of his first year, at the Humanististches Gymnasium in Basel, Jung was pushed to the ground by another boy so hard that he momentarily lost consciousness. Jung later recognized that the incident was indirectly his fault. A thought then came to him, now he won't have to go to school anymore. From then on, whenever he walked to school or began homework, he fainted. He remained at home for the next six months until he overheard his father speaking hurriedly to a visitor about the boy's future ability to support himself. They suspected he had epilepsy. Confronted with the reality of his family's poverty, he realized the need for academic excellence. He went into his father's study and began poring over Latin grammar. He fainted three more times but eventually overcame the urge and did not faint again. This event, Jung later recalled, was when I learned what a neurosis is. University Studies and Early Career Initially, Jung had aspirations of becoming a preacher or minister in his early life. There was a strong moral sense in his household, and several of his family members were clergymen as well. For a time, Jung had wanted to study archaeology, but his family could not afford to send him further than the University of Basel, which did not teach archaeology. After studying philosophy in his teens, Jung decided against the path of religious traditionalism and decided instead to pursue psychiatry and medicine. His interest was immediately captured it combined the biological and the spiritual, exactly what he was searching for. In 1895, Jung began to study medicine at the University of Basel. Barely a year later, in 1896, his father Paul died and left the family near destitute. They were helped out by relatives who also contributed to Jung's studies. During his student days, he entertained his contemporaries with the family legend that his paternal grandfather was the illegitimate son of Gove and his German great-grandmother, Sophie Ziegler. In later life, he pulled back from this tale, saying only that Sophie was a friend of Gove's niece. In 1900, Jung moved to Zurich and began working at the Burgholzli Psychiatric Hospital under Eugen Bleuler. Fleuler was already in communication with the Austrian neurologist Sigmund Freud. Jung's dissertation, published in 1903, 
was titled on the psychology and pathology of so-called occult phenomena. It was based on the analysis of the supposed mediumship of Jung's cousin Helene Prey's work, under the influence of Freud's contemporary Theodore Flournoy. Jung also studied with Pierre Janet in Paris in 1902, and later equated his view of the complex with Janet's a defix subconceit. In 1905, Jung was appointed as a permanent senior doctor at the hospital, and also became a lecturer private doesn't in the medical faculty of Zurich University. In 1904, he published with Franz Riechlin their Diagnostic Association Studies, of which Freud obtained a copy. In 1909, Jung left the psychiatric hospital and began a private practice in his home in Kusnacht. Eventually, a close friendship and a strong professional association developed between the elder Freud and Jung, which left a sizable correspondence. For six years, they cooperated in their work. In 1912, however, Jung published Psychology of the Unconscious, which made manifest the developing theoretical divergence between the two. Consequently, their personal and professional relationship fractured, each stating that the other was unable to admit he could be wrong. After the culminating break in 1913, Jung went through a difficult and pivotal psychological transformation, exacerbated by the outbreak of the First World War. Henry Ellenberger called Jung's intense experience a creative illness and compared it favorably to Freud's own period of what he called neurasthenia and hysteria. 173. Marriage. <laughs> marriage. Marriage. In 1903, Jung married Emma Rostenbach, seven years his junior and the elder daughter of a wealthy industrialist in eastern Switzerland, Johannes Rostenbach Schenk and his wife. Rostenbach was the owner, among other concerns, of IWC Schaffhausen, the international watch company manufacturers of luxury timepieces. Upon his death in 1905, his two daughters and their husbands became owners of the business. Jung's brother-in-law Ernst Homerger became the principal proprietor, but the Jungs remained shareholders in a thriving business that ensured the family's financial security for decades. Emma Jung, whose education had been limited, evinced considerable ability and interest in her husband's research and threw herself into studies and acted as his assistant at Burgalsley. She eventually became a noted psychoanalyst in her own right. They had five children, Agathe, Gret, France, Marion, and Helene. The marriage lasted until Emma died in 1955. During his marriage, Jung allegedly engaged in extramarital relationships. His alleged affairs with Sabina Spielrein and Tony Wolfe were the most widely discussed. Though it was mostly taken for granted that Jung's relationship with Spielrein included a sexual relationship, this assumption has been disputed, in particular by Henry Z. V. I. Lothain. Wartime Army Service During World War I, Jung was drafted as an army doctor and soon made commandant of an internment camp for British officers and soldiers. The Swiss were neutral and obliged to intern personnel from either side of the conflict, who crossed their frontier to evade capture. Jung worked to improve the conditions of soldiers stranded in Switzerland and encouraged them to attend university courses. Relationship with Freud Meeting and Collaboration Jung and Freud influenced each other during the intellectually formative years of Jung's life. Jung had become interested in psychiatry as a student by reading Psychopathia Sexualis by Richard von Kraft Ebbing. In 1900, Jung completed his degree and started work as an intern voluntary doctor under the psychiatrist Eugen Bleuler at Burgalsley Hospital. It was Bleuler who introduced him to the writings of Freud by asking him to write a review of the interpretation of Dreams 1899. In the early 1900s, psychology as a science was still in its early stages, but Jung became a qualified proponent of Freud's new psychoanalysis. At the time, Freud needed collaborators and pupils to validate and spread his ideas. Burgalsley was a renowned psychiatric clinic in Zurich and Jung's research had already gained him international recognition. Jung sent Freud a copy of his studies in Word Association in 1906. The same year, 
he published Diagnostic Association Studies, which he later sent a copy of to Freud, who had already purchased a copy. Preceded by a lively correspondence, Jung met Freud for the first time in Vienna on 3 March 1907. Jung recalled the discussion between himself and Freud as interminable, unceasing for 13 hours. Six months later, the then 50-year-old Freud sent a collection of his latest published essays to Jung in Zurich. This marked the beginning of an intense correspondence and collaboration that lasted six years. In 1908, Jung became an editor of the newly founded yearbook for psychoanalytical and psychopathological research. In 1909, Jung traveled with Freud and Hungarian psychoanalyst Sander Ferenczi to the United States. They took part in a conference at Clark University in Worcester, Massachusetts. The conference at Clark University was planned by the psychologist G. Stanley Hall and included 27 distinguished psychiatrists, neurologists, and psychologists. It represented a watershed in the acceptance of psychoanalysis in North America. This forged welcome links between Jung and influential Americans. Jung returned to the United States the next year for a brief visit. In 1910, Freud proposed Jung his adopted eldest son, his crown prince and successor, for the position of lifetime president of the newly formed International Psychoanalytical Association. However, after forceful objections from his Viennese colleagues, it was agreed Jung would be elected to serve a two-year term of office. Divergence and Break While Jung worked on his Psychology of the Unconscious, a study of the transformations and symbolisms of the libido, Tensions manifested between him and Freud because of various disagreements, including those concerning the nature of libido. Jung de emphasized the importance of sexual development and focused on the collective unconscious, the part of the unconscious that contains memories and ideas that Jung believed were inherited from ancestors. While he did think that libido was an important source for personal growth, unlike Freud, Jung did not believe that libido alone was responsible for the formation of the core personality. In 1912, these tensions came to a peak because Jung felt severely slighted after Freud visited his colleague Ludwig Beinswanger in Kuslingen without paying him a visit in nearby Zurich, an incident Jung referred to as the Kuslingen gesture. Shortly thereafter, Jung again traveled to the United States and gave the Fordham University lectures a six-week series, which were published later in the year as Psychology of the Unconscious subsequently republished as Symbols of Transformation. While they contain some remarks on Jung's dissenting view on the libido, they represent largely a psychoanalytical Jung and not the theory of analytical psychology for which he became famous in the following decades. Nonetheless, it was their publication which, Jung declared, cost me my friendship with Freud. Another primary disagreement with Freud stemmed from their differing concepts of the unconscious. Jung saw Freud's theory of the unconscious as incomplete and unnecessarily negative and inelastic. According to Jung, Freud conceived the unconscious solely as a repository of repressed emotions and desires. Jung's observations overlap to an extent with Freud's model of the unconscious, what Jung called the personal unconscious, but his hypothesis is more about a process than a static model, and he also proposed the existence of a second, overarching form of the unconscious beyond the personal, that he named the psychoid a term borrowed from neo-vitalist philosopher, and the collective unconscious is not so much a geographical location, but a deduction from the alleged ubiquity of archetypes over space and time. In November 1912, Jung and Freud met in Munich for a meeting among prominent colleagues to discuss psychoanalytical journals. At a talk about a new psychoanalytic essay on Amenhotep Roman Roman IV, Jung expressed his views on how it related to actual conflicts in the psychoanalytic movement. While Jung spoke, Freud suddenly fainted and Jung carried him to a couch. Jung and Freud personally met for the last time in September 1913 for the Fourth International Psychoanalytical Congress in Munich. Jung gave a talk on psychological types, the introverted and extroverted type in analytical psychology. Midlife Isolation 
It was the publication of Jung's book Psychology of the Unconscious in 1912 that led to the break with Freud. Letters they exchanged show Freud's refusal to consider Jung's ideas. This rejection caused what Jung described in his posthumous 1962 autobiography, Memories, Dreams, Reflections, as a resounding censure. Everyone he knew dropped away except for two of his colleagues. Jung described his book as an attempt, only partially successful, to create a wider setting for medical psychology and to bring the whole of the psychic phenomena within its purview. The book was later revised and retitled Symbols of Transformation in 1922. London, 1913-14 Jung spoke at meetings of the Psychomedical Society in London in 1913 and 1914. His travels were soon interrupted by the war, but his ideas continued to receive attention in England primarily. The Black Books and the Red Book in 1913, at the age of 38, Jung experienced a horrible confrontation with the unconscious. He saw visions and heard voices. He worried at times that he was menaced by a psychosis or was doing a schizophrenia. He decided that it was valuable experience and in private, he induced hallucinations or, in his words, a process of active imagination. He recorded everything he experienced in small journals, which Jung referred to in the singular as his black book. The material Jung wrote was subjected to several edits handwritten and typed, including another, second layer of text, his continual psychological interpretations during the process of editing. Around 1915, Jung commissioned a large red. Jung left no posthumous instructions about the final disposition of what he called the Liber Novus, or the red book. Sanu Shandasani, an historian of psychology from London, tried for three years to persuade Jung's resistant heirs to have it published. Ulrich Horney, Jung's grandson who manages the Jung archives, decided to publish it when the necessary additional funds needed were raised through the Feilman Foundation. Up to mid-September 2008, fewer than two dozen people had ever seen it. In 2007, two technicians for digital fusion working with New York City publishers W. W. Norton and Company, scanned the manuscript with a 10,000. It was published on 7 October 2009 in German, with a separate English translation along with Shamdasani's introduction and footnotes at the back of the book. According to Sara Corbett, reviewing the text for the New York Times, the book is bombastic, baroque, and like so much else about Carl Jung, a willful oddity, synced with an antediluvian and mystical reality. The Rubin Museum of Art in New York City displayed Jung's red book leather folio, as well as some of his original black book journals from seven According to them, during the period in which he worked on this book, Jung developed his principal theories of archetypes, collective unconscious, and the process of individuation. Two-thirds of the pages bear Jung's illuminations and illustrations to the text, Travels. Jung emerged from his period of isolation in the late 19 teens with the publication of several journal articles, followed in 1921 with Psychological Types, one of his most influential books. There followed a decade of active publication, interspersed with overseas travels. England, 1920, 1923, 1925, 1935, 1938, 1946. Constance Long arranged for Jung to deliver a seminar in Cornwall in 1920. Another seminar was held in 1923, this one organized by Jung's British protégé, Helton Godwin Baines, known as Peter 1882-1943, and another in 1925. In 1935, at the invitation of his close British friends and colleagues, H. G. Baines, E. A. Bennett, and Hugh Crichton Miller, Jung gave a series of lectures at the Tavistock Clinic in London, later published as part of the collected works. In 1938, Jung was awarded an honorary degree by the University of Oxford. At the 10th International Medical Congress for Psychotherapy held at Oxford from 29 July to 2 August 1938, Jung gave the presidential address, 
followed by a visit to Cheshire to stay with the Bailey family at Lawton Mere. In 1946, Jung agreed to become the first honorary president of the newly formed Society of Analytical Psychology in London, having previously approved its training program devised by Michael Fordham. United States 1909-1912-1924-25-1936-37 During the period of Jung's collaboration with Freud, both visited the U.S. in 1909 to lecture at Clark University, Worcester, Massachusetts, where both were awarded honorary degrees. In 1912, Jung gave a series of lectures at Fordham University, New York, which were published later in the year as Psychology of the Unconscious. Jung made a more extensive trip westward in the winter of 1924-5, financed and organized by Fowler McCormick and George Porter. Of particular value to Jung was a visit with Chief Mountain Lake of the Taos Pueblo near Taos, New Mexico. Jung made another trip to America in 1936, receiving an honorary degree at Harvard and giving lectures in New York and New England for his growing group of American followers. He returned in 1937 to deliver the Terry Lectures at Yale University, later published as Psychology and Religion. East Africa In October 1925, Jung embarked on his most ambitious expedition, the Bujishu Psychological Expedition to East Africa. He was accompanied by his English friend, Peter Baines, and an American associate, George Beckwith. On the voyage to Africa, they became acquainted with an English woman named Ruth Bailey, who joined their safari a few weeks later. The group traveled through Kenya and Uganda to the slopes of Mount Elgon, where Jung hoped to increase his understanding of primitive psychology through conversations with the culturally isolated residents of that area. Later, he concluded that the major insights he had gleaned had to do with himself and the European psychology in which he had been raised. One of Jung's most famous proposed constructs is kinship libido. Jung defined this as an instinctive feeling of belonging to a particular group or family, and Jung believed it was vital to the human experience and used this as an endogamous aspect of the libido and what lies amongst the family. This could be a term Jung learned during his trip to Africa and is similar to a Bantu term called Ubuntu that emphasizes humanity and almost the same meaning as kinship libido, which is I am because you are. India In December 1937, Jung left Zurich again for an extensive tour of India with Fowler McCormick. In India, he felt himself under the direct influence of a foreign culture for the first time. In Africa, his conversations had been strictly limited by the language barrier, but in India, he was able to converse extensively. Hindu philosophy became an important element in his understanding of the role of symbolism and the life of the unconscious, though he avoided a meeting with Ramana Maharshi. He described Ramana as being absorbed in the self. Jung became seriously ill on this trip and endured two weeks of delirium in a Calcutta hospital. After 1938, his travels were confined to Europe. Later years and death, Jung became a full professor of medical psychology at the University of Basel in 1943, but resigned after a heart attack the next year to lead a more private life. He became ill again in 1952. Jung continued to publish books until the end of his life, including Flying Saucers, a modern myth of things seen in the skies, 1959, which analyzed the archetypal meaning and possible psychological significance of the reported observations of UFO. He also enjoyed a friendship with an English Roman Catholic priest, Father Victor White, who corresponded with Jung after he had published his controversial answer to Jung. In 1961, Jung wrote his last work, A Contribution to Man and His Symbols Entitled Approaching the Unconscious, published posthumously in 1964. Jung died on 6 June 1961 at Kusnacht after a short illness. At 450, he had been beset by circulatory diseases. Awards Among his principal distinctions are honorary doctorates from Clark University, 1909. Fordham University 1912, 
Harvard University, 1936, University of Allahabad, 1937, University of Beniers, 1937, University of Calcutta, 1938, University of Oxford, 1938, University of Geneva, 1945, Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich, 1955, on his 80th birthday. In addition, he was, was, given a literature prize from the city of Zurich, 1932, made titular professor of the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich, ETH 1935, appointed honorary member of the Royal Society of Medicine, 1939, given a festrift at Arados, 1945, appointed president of the Society of Analytical Psychology, London, 1946, given a festrift by students and friends, 1955, named honorary citizen of Kusnecht, 1960, on his 85th birthday. Thought Jung's thought was formed by early family influences which on the maternal side were a blend of interest in the occult and in solid reformed academic theology. On his father's side were two important figures, his grandfather, the physician and academic scientist Carl Gustav Jung, and Lott Kessner, the niece of German polymath Johann Wolfgang Goethe's Lachen. Although he was a practicing clinician and writer, and as such founded analytical psychology, much of his life's work was spent exploring other areas such as quantum physics, vitalism, Eastern and Western philosophy including epistemology, alchemy, astrology, and sociology, as well as literature and the arts. Jung's interest in philosophy and spiritual subjects led many to view him as a mystic, although his preference was to be seen as a man of science, Jung was unlike Freud heavily knowledgeable on philosophical concepts and aimed to link the branch of epistemology to the more modern theories of psychology. Key Concepts Within the field of analytical psychology, a brief survey of major concepts developed by Jung include alphabetical, anima, and animus archetype the contrasexual aspect of a person's psyche. In a woman's psyche, her inner personal masculine is conceived both as a complex and an archetypal image comparably in a man's psyche. His inner personal feminine is conceived both as a complex and an archetypal image. Archetype, a concept borrowed from anthropology to denote supposedly universal and recurring mental images or themes. Jung's descriptions of archetypes varied over time. Archetypal images, universal symbols that can mediate opposites in the psyche, often found in religious art, mythology, and fairy tales across cultures. Collective unconscious aspects of unconsciousness experienced by all people in different cultures. Complex, the repressed organization of images and experiences that governs perception and behavior. Extroversion and introversion personality traits of degrees of openness or reserve contributing to psychological type. Individuation, the process of fulfillment of each individual which negates neither the conscious or unconscious position but does justice to them both. Persona element of the personality that arises for reasons of adaptation or personal convenience the masks one puts on in various situations. Psychological types of framework for consciously orienting psychotherapists to patients by raising to consciousness particular modes of personality, Differentiation between analyst and patient. Shadow archetype the repressed, therefore unknown, aspects of the personality including those often considered to be negative. Self archetype the central overarching concept governing the individuation process, as symbolized by mandalas, the union of male and female, totality, unity. Jung viewed it as the psyche is central archetype. Synchronicity and a causal principle as a basis for the apparently random simultaneous occurrence of phenomena. Collective unconscious Since the establishment of psychoanalytic theory, the notion and meaning of individuals having a personal unconscious has gradually come to be common knowledge. This was popularized by both Freud and Jung. Whereas an individual's personal unconscious is made up of thoughts and emotions which have, at some time, been experienced or held in mind, but which have been repressed or forgotten. In contrast, 
the collective unconscious is neither acquired by activities within an individual's life, nor a container of things that are thoughts, memories, or ideas which are capable of the contents of it were never naturally known through physical or cognitive experience and then forgotten. The collective unconscious consists of universal heritable elements common to all humans, distinct from other species. It encapsulates fields of evolutionary biology, history of civilization, ethnology, brain and nervous system development, and general psychological development. Considering its composition in practical physiological and psychological terms, it consists of pre-existent forms, the archetypes, which can only become conscious secondarily and which give definite form to certain psychic contents. Specifically contrasting himself from the work of Freud and Adler, who were wholly concerned with personal psychology. Jung writes, Jung considers that science would hardly deny the existence and basic nature of instincts, existing as a whole set of motivating urges. The collective unconscious acts as the frame where science can distinguish individual motivating urges, thought to be universal across all individuals of the human species, while instincts are present in all species. Jung contends, the hypothesis of the collective unconscious is therefore no more daring than to assume there are instincts. Archetype The archetype is a concept borrowed from anthropology to denote a process of nature. Jung's definitions of archetypes varied over time and have been the subject of debate as to their usefulness. Archetypal images, also referred to as motifs in mythology, or universal symbols that can mediate opposites in the psyche, are often found in religious art, mythology, and fairy tales across cultures. Jung saw archetypes as pre-configurations in nature that give rise to repeating, understandable, describable experiences. In addition, the concept takes into account the passage of time and of patterns resulting from transformation. Archetypes are said to exist independently of any current event or its effect. They are said to exert influence both across all domains of experience and throughout the stages of each individual's unique development. Being in part based on heritable physiology, they are thought to have existed since humans became a differentiated species. They have been deduced through the development of storytelling over tens of thousands of years, indicating repeating patterns of individual and group experience, behaviors, and effects across the planet, apparently displaying common themes. The concept did not originate with Jung but with Plato, who first conceived of primordial patterns. Later contributions came from Adolf Bastian and Hermann Usener, among others. In the first half of the 20th century, it proved impossible to objectively isolate and categorize the notion of an archetype within a materialist frame. According to Jung, there are as many archetypes as there are typical situations in life, and he asserted that they have a dynamic mutual influence on one another. Their alleged presence could be extracted from thousand-year-old narratives, from comparative religion and mythology. Jung elaborated many archetypes in the archetypes in the collective unconscious and in aeon researches into the phenomenology of the self. Examples of archetypes might be the shadow, the hero, the self, anima, animus, mother, father, child, and trickster. Shadow The shadow exists as part of the unconscious mind and is composed of the traits individuals instinctively or consciously resist identifying as their own and would rather ignore typically repressed ideas, weaknesses, desires, instincts, and shortcomings. Much of the shadow comes as a result of an individual's adaptation to cultural norms and expectations. Thus, this archetype not only consists of all the things deemed unacceptable by society, but also those that are not aligned with one's own personal morals and values. Jung argues that the shadow plays a distinctive role in balancing one's overall psyche, the counterbalancing to consciousness where there is light. There must also be shadow. Without a well-developed shadow, often shadow work, integrating one's shadow, an individual can become shallow and extremely preoccupied with the opinions of others, that is, a walking persona. Not wanting to look at their shadows directly, Jung argues, often results in psychological projection. 
individuals project imagined attitudes onto others without awareness. The qualities an individual may hate or love in another may be manifestly present in the individual who does not see the external, material truth. In order to truly grow as an individual, Jung believed that both the persona and shadow should be balanced. The shadow can appear in dreams or visions, often taking the form of a dark, wild, exotic figure. Extroversion and Introversion Jung was one of the first people to define introversion and extroversion in a psychological context. In Jung's psychological types, he theorizes that each person falls into one of two categories, the introvert and the extrovert. These two psychological types Jung compares to ancient archetypes, Apollo and Dionysus. The introvert is likened to Apollo, who shines a light on understanding. The introvert is focused on the internal world of reflection, dreaming, and vision, thoughtful and insightful. The introvert can sometimes be uninterested in joining the activities of others. The extrovert is associated with Dionysus, interested in joining the activities of the world. The extrovert is focused on the outside world of objects, sensory perception, and action. Energetic and lively, the extrovert may lose their sense of self in the intoxication of Dionysian pursuits. Jungian introversion and extroversion is quite different from the modern idea of introversion and extroversion. Modern theories often stay true to behaviorist means of describing such a trait sociability, talkativeness, assertiveness, etc. Whereas Jungian introversion and extroversion is expressed as a perspective, introverts interpret the world subjectively, whereas extroverts interpret the world objectively. Persona, persona, uh -huh. In his psychological theory, which is not necessarily linked, to a particular theory of social structure, the persona appears as a consciously created personality or identity fashioned out of part of the collective psyche through socialization, acculturation, and experience. Jung applied the term persona explicitly because in Latin it means both personality and the masks worn by Roman actors of the classical period, expressive of the individual roles played. The persona, he argues, is a mask for the collective psyche, a mask that pretends individuality so that both self and others believe in that identity, even if it is really no more than a well-played role through which the collective psyche is expressed. Jung regarded the persona mask as a complicated system which mediates between individual consciousness and the social community. It is a compromise between the individual and society as to what a man should appear to be. But he also makes it quite explicit that it is, in substance, a character mask in the classical sense known to theater, with its double function, both intended to make a certain impression on others, and to hide part of the true nature of the individual. The therapist then aims to assist the individuation process through which the client regains their own self by liberating the self, both from the deceptive cover of the persona and from the power of unconscious impulses. Jung has become enormously influential in management theory, not just because managers and executives have to create an appropriate management persona, a corporate mask, and a persuasive identity, but also because they have to evaluate what sort of people the workers are, to manage them, for example, using personality tests and peer reviews. Spirituality Jung's work on himself and his patients convinced him that life has a spiritual purpose beyond material goals. Our main task, he believed, is to discover and fulfill our deep, innate potential. Based on his study of Christianity, Hinduism, Buddhism, Gnosticism, Taoism, and other traditions, Jung believed that this journey of transformation, which he called individuation, is at the mystical heart of all religions. It is a journey to meet the self and at the same time to meet the divine. Unlike Freud's objectivist worldview, Jung's pantheism may have led him to believe that spiritual experience was essential to our well-being, as he specifically identifies individual human life with the universe as a whole. In 1959, Jung was asked by host John Freeman on the BBC interview program Face to Face whether he believed in God, to which Jung answered, I do not need to believe, I know. 
Jung's ideas on religion counterbalance Freudian skepticism. Jung's idea of religion as a practical road to individuation is still treated in modern textbooks on the psychology of religion, though his ideas have also been criticized. Jung recommended spirituality as a cure for alcoholism, and he is considered to have had an indirect role in establishing Alcoholics Anonymous. Jung once treated an American patient Roland Hazard Roman III, suffering from chronic alcoholism. After working with the patient for some time and achieving no significant progress, Jung told the man that his alcoholic condition was near to hopeless, save only the possibility of a spiritual experience. Jung noted that, occasionally, such experiences had been known to reform alcoholics when all other options had failed. Hazard took Jung's advice seriously and set about seeking a personal, spiritual experience. He returned home to the United States and joined a Christian evangelical movement known as the Oxford Group, later known as Moral Rearmament. He also told other alcoholics what Jung had told him about the importance of a spiritual experience. One of the alcoholics he brought into the Oxford Group was Ebby Thasher, a longtime friend and drinking buddy of Bill Wilson, later co founder of Alcoholics Anonymous AA. Thasher told Wilson about the Oxford Group and through them, Wilson became aware of Hazard's experience with Jung. The influence of Jung thus indirectly found its way into the formation of Alcoholics Anonymous, the original 12-step program. The above claims are documented in the letters of Jung and Bill Wilson, excerpts of which can be found in Pass It On, published by Alcoholics Anonymous. Although the detail of this story is disputed by some historians, Jung himself discussed an Oxford Group member, who may have been the same person in talks given around 1940. The remarks were distributed privately in transcript form. From shorthand taken by an attender, Jung reportedly approved the transcript, and later recorded in volume 18 of his collected works, The Symbolic Life. For instance, when a member of the Oxford Group comes to me in order to get treatment, I say you are in the Oxford Group, so long as you are there you settle your affair with the Oxford Group. I can't do it better than Jesus. Jung goes on to state that he has seen similar cures among Roman Catholics. The 12-step program of Alcoholics Anonymous has an intense psychological backdrop involving the human ego and dichotomy between the conscious and unconscious mind. Inquiries into the Paranormal Jung had an apparent interest in the paranormal and occult. For decades, he attended seances and claimed to have witnessed parapsychic phenomena. Initially, he attributed these to psychological causes, even delivering a 1919 lecture in England for the Society for Psychical Research on the Psychological Foundations for the Belief in Spirits. However, he began to doubt whether an exclusively psychological approach can do justice to the phenomena in question and stated that the spirit hypothesis yields better results. Showing his own skepticism toward this postulation, as he could not find material evidence of the existence of spirits, Jung's ideas about the paranormal culminated in synchronicity. This is the idea that certain coincidences manifest in the world have exceptionally intense meaning to observers. Such coincidences have great effect on the observer from multiple cumulative aspects, from the immediate personal relevance of the coincidence to the observer, from the peculiarities of the nature of the character, novelty, curiosity of any such coincidence, from the sheer improbability of the coincidence, having no apparent causal link, hence Jung's essay subtitle and a causal connecting. Despite his own experiments failing to confirm the phenomenon, he held on to the idea as an explanation for apparent ESP. In addition, he proposed it as a functional explanation for how the I Ching worked, although he was never clear about how synchronicity worked. Interpretation of Quantum Mechanics Jung influenced one philosophical interpretation, not the science of quantum physics, with the concept of synchronicity regarding some events as non-causal. That idea influenced the physicist Wolfgang Pauli, with whom, via letter correspondence, he developed the notion of unius mundus in connection with the notion of non-locality and some other physicists. Alchemy Jung's acquaintance with alchemy came between 1928-1930, 
when he was introduced to a manuscript of the secret of the golden flower translated by richard wilhelm the work and writings of jung from the nineteen thirties onwards shifted to a focus on the psychological significance of alchemy in 1944 jung published psychology and alchemy in which he analyzed the alchemical symbols and came to the conclusion that there is a direct relationship between them and the psychoanalytical process he argued that the alchemical process was the transformation of the impure soul lead to perfected soul gold and a metaphor for the individuation process in 1963, Mysterium Kanayamshanis first appeared in English as part of the collected works of C. G. Jung. Mysterium Kanayamshanis was Jung's last major book and focused on the Mysterium Kanayamshanis archetype, known as the sacred marriage between sun and moon. Jung argued that the stages of the alchemists, the blackening, the whitening, the reddening, and the yellowing, could be taken as symbolic of individuation, his chosen term for personal growth 75. Art Therapy Jung proposed that art can be used to alleviate or contain feelings of trauma, fear, or anxiety, and also to repair, restore, and heal. In his work with patients and his own personal explorations, Jung wrote that art expression and images found in dreams could help recover from trauma and emotional distress. At times of emotional distress, he often drew, painted, or made objects and constructions which he recognized as more than recreational. Dance slash movement therapy. Dance slash movement therapy as active imagination was created by Carl Gustav Jung and Tony Wolf in 1916 and was practiced by Tina Keller Jenny and other analysts but remained largely unknown until the 1950s when it was rediscovered by Marion Chase and therapist Mary Whitehouse. White House, after studying with Martha Graham and Mary Wigman, became herself a dancer and teacher of modern dance as well as Swiss dancer Trudy Scoop in 1963, who is considered one of the founders of the dance slash movement therapy in the United States. Political Views The State Jung stressed the importance of individual rights in a person's relation to the state and society. He saw that the state was treated as a quasi-animate personality from whom everything is expected, but that this personality was only camouflaged for those individuals who know how to manipulate it and referred to the state as a form of slavery. He also thought that the state swallowed up people's religious forces, and therefore that the state had taken the place of God making it comparable to a religion in which state slavery is a form of worship. Jung observed that state acts of the state are comparable to religious displays, brass bands, flags, banners, parades, and monster demonstrations are no different in principle from ecclesiastical processions, cannonades, and fire to scare off demons. From Jung's perspective, this replacement of God with the state in a mass society leads to the dislocation of the religious drive, and results in the same fanaticism of the church states of the Dark Ages wherein the more the state is worshipped, the more freedom and morality are suppressed. This ultimately leaves the individual psychically undeveloped with extreme feelings of marginalization. Germany, 1933-1939 to 1939. Jung had many Jewish friends and colleagues and maintained relations with them throughout the 1930s despite prevailing anti-Semitism. Until 1939, he also maintained professional relations with psychotherapists in Germany who had declared their support for the Nazi regime. Some scholars alleged that he himself sympathized with the regime. In 1933, after the Nazis gained power in Germany, Jung took part in the restructuring of the General Medical Society for Psychotherapy Algemeen Arstliche Gesellschaft for Psychotherapy a German-based professional body with an international membership. The society was reorganized into two distinct bodies, a strictly German body, the Deutsch Algemeen Arstliche Gesellschaft for Psychotherapie, led by Matthias Goring, an Adlerian psychotherapist, and a cousin of the prominent Nazi Hermann Goring in Goring, International General Medical Society for Psychotherapy, led by Jung. 
the German body was to be affiliated to the International Society, as were new national societies being set up in Switzerland and elsewhere. The International Society's constitution permitted individual doctors to join it directly, rather than through one of the national affiliated societies, a provision to which Jung drew attention in a circular in 1934. This implied that German Jewish doctors could maintain their professional status as individual members of the international body, even though they were excluded from the German affiliate as well as from other German medical societies operating under the Nazis. As leader of the international body, Jung assumed overall responsibility for its publication, the Zentralblatt für Psychotherapie. In 1933, this journal published a statement endorsing Nazi positions and Hitler's book Mein Kampf. In 1934, Jung wrote in a Swiss publication, the New Zürcher Zeitung, that he experienced great surprise and disappointment when the Zentralblatt associated his name, Jung went on to say the main point is to get a young and insecure science into a place of safety during an earthquake. He did not end his relationship with the Zentralblatt at this time, but he did arrange the appointment of a new managing editor, Karl Alfred Mayer of Switzerland. For the next few years, the Zentralblatt under Jung and Mayer maintained a position distinct from that of the Nazis, in that it continued to acknowledge contributions of Jewish doctors to psychotherapy. In the face of energetic German attempts to nazify the international body, Jung resigned from its presidency in 1939, the year the Second World War started. Nazism and Antisemitism Jung's interest in European mythology and folk psychology was shared by the Nazis. Richard Nall describes Jung's own reaction to this connection. Jung clearly identifies himself with the spirit of German Wolfstumspugung throughout this period, and well into the 1920s and 1930s, until the horrors of Nazism finally compelled him to reframe these neo-pagan metaphors in a negative light in his 1936 essay on Watten. Various statements made by Jung in the 1930s have been cited as evidence of both contempt for Nazism and sympathy for Nazism. In the 1936 essay Watten, Jung described the influence of Adolf Hitler on Germany as one man who is obviously possessed has infected a whole nation to such an extent that everything is set in motion and has started rolling on its course towards Purdy. He would later say, during a lengthy interview with H. R. Knickerbocker in October 1938, Hitler seemed like the double of a real person, as if Hitler the man might be hiding inside like an appendix, and deliberately so concealed in order not to disturb the mechanism. Penism, 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 the mechanism. Penism, 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 you know you could never talk to this man because there is nobody there. There is nobody there. There is 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 there. Body there. There is there. There is there. Body there. There is there. It is not an individual. It is an entire nation. Jung consistently rejected accusations of antisemitism. In a 1948 interview with Carol Bauman, he stated, It must be clear to anyone who has read any of my books that I have never been a Nazi sympathizer, and I never have been anti-Semitic, and no amount of misquotation, mistranslation, or rearrangement of what I have written can alter the record of my true point of view. Nearly every one of these passages has been tampered with either by malice or by ignorance. Furthermore, my friendly relations with a large group of Jewish colleagues and patients over a period of many years in itself disproves the charge of anti-Semitism. The accusations, however, have continued to be made concerning Jung's statements. Avner Falk cites articles such as The State of Psychotherapy Today, published in 1934, in the Central Blatt for Psychotherapy, where Jung wrote, the Aryan unconscious has a greater potential than the Jewish unconscious and the Jew, who is something of a nomad, has never yet created a cultural form of his own and as far as we can see never will. Andrew Samuels argues that his remarks on the Aryan unconscious and the corrosive character of Freud's Jewish gospel demonstrate 
and anti-Semitism fundamental to the structure of Jung's thought. Service to the Allies during World War Roman II, Min II, Roman II. Jung was in contact with Alan Dulles of the Office of Strategic Services, predecessor of the Central Intelligence Agency, and provided valuable intelligence on the psychological condition of Hitler. Dulles referred to Jung as Agent 488 and offered the following description of his service. Nobody will probably ever know how much Professor Jung contributed to the Allied cause during the war by seeing people who were connected somehow with the other side. Jung's service to the Allied cause through the OSS remained classified after the war. Views on Homosexuality Jung addressed homosexuality in his published writings in one comment specifying that homosexuality should not be a concern of legal authorities nor be considered a crime. He also claimed that homosexuality does not reduce the value of a person as a member of society. However, Jung has also stated that homosexuality is a result of psychological immaturity, but only if one's sexuality is not an aspect of their sexuality and constitutional characteristics. Psychedelics Jung's theories are considered to be a useful therapeutic framework for the analysis of unconscious phenomena that become manifest in the acute psychedelic state. This view is based on correspondence Jung had with researchers involved in psychedelic research in the 1950s, as well as more recent neuroimaging research where subjects who are administered psychedelic compounds seem to have archetypal religious experiences of unity and ego dissolution associated with reduced activity in. This research has led to a reevaluation, for example, in a chapter entitled Integrating the Archaic and the Modern The Red Book, Visual Cognitive Modalities in the Neuroscience of Altered States of Consciousness in the 2020 volume Jung's Red Book for Our Time, Searching for Soul Under Postmodern Conditions, Volume 4, it is argued Jung was a pioneer who explored uncharted cognitive domain, while such domains of experience are not part of mainstream Western culture and thought, they are central to various indigenous cultures who use psychedelics such as iboga, and ayahuasca during rituals to alter consciousness. As the author writes, Jung seems to have been dealing with modes of consciousness alien to mainstream Western thought, exploring the terrain of uncharted cognitive domains. I argue that science is beginning to catch up with Jung, who was a pioneer, whose insights contribute a great deal to our emerging understanding of human consciousness. In this analysis, Jung's paintings of his visions in the Red Book were compared to the paintings of Ayahuasca visions by the Peruvian shaman Pablo Amarino. Commenting on research that was being undertaken during the 1950s, Jung wrote the following in a letter to Betty Eisner, a psychologist who was involved in LSD research at the University of California. Experiments along the line of mescaline and related drugs are certainly most interesting since such drugs lay bare a level of the unconscious that is otherwise an article published in 2021 in the International Journal of Jungian Studies entitled Carl Jung and the Psychedelic Brain, an Evolutionary Model of Analytical Psychology Informed by Psychedelic Neuroscience discusses Jung's attitude towards psychedelics, as well as the applicability of his ideas to current research. As the author writes Jung's, legitimate reservations about the clinical use of psychedelics are no longer relevant, as the field has progressed significantly, devising robust clinical and experimental protocols for psychedelic-assisted therapies. That said Jung's concept of individuation, that is the integration of the archaic unconscious with consciousness, seems extreme. Legacy The Myers-Briggs type indicator in BTI, a popular psychometric instrument, and the concepts of socionics were developed from Jung's theory of psychological types. Jung saw the human psyche as by nature religious and made this religiousness the focus of his explorations. Jung is one of the best known contemporary contributors to dream analysis and symbolization. His influence on popular psychology, the psychologization of religion, spirituality, and the New Age movement has been immense. A review of General Psychology Survey, published in 2002, ranked Jung as the 23rd most cited psychologist of the 20th century.
in popular culture. Literature Lawrence van der Post was an Afrikaner author who claimed to have had a 16-year friendship with Jung, from which a number of books and a film were created about Jung. The accuracy of van der Post's claims about his relationship to Jung has been questioned. Hermann Hesse, author of works such as Siddhartha and Steppenwolf, was treated by Joseph Lang, a student of Jung. For Hess, this began a long preoccupation with psychoanalysis, through which he came to know Jung personally. In his novel The World is Made of Glass, 1983, Morris West gives a fictional account of one of Jung's cases, placing the events in 1913. According to the author's note, the novel is based upon a case recorded, very briefly, by Carl Gustav Jung in his autobiographical work Memories, Dreams, Reflections. The Canadian novelist Robertson Davies made Jungian analysis a central part of his 1970 novel, The Manticore. He stated in a letter, There have been other books which describe Freudian analyses, but I know of no other that describes a Jungian analysis, adding I was deeply afraid that I would put my foot in it, for I have never undergone one of those barnacle scraping experiences, and knew of it only through reading. So I was greatly pleased when some of my Jungian friends in Zurich liked it. Art The visionary Swiss painter Peter Burkhauser was treated by a student of Jung, Marie-Louise von Franz, and corresponded with Jung about the translation of dream symbolism. American abstract expressionist Jackson Pollock underwent Jungian psychotherapy in 1939 with Joseph Henderson. Henderson engaged, Pollock through his art, having him make drawings which led to the appearance of many Jungian concepts in his paintings. Contrary to some sources, Jung did not visit Liverpool but recorded a dream, in which he did, and of which he wrote, Liverpool is the pool of life it makes to live. A plaster statue of Jung was erected in Matthew Street in 1987 that was vandalized and replaced by a more durable version in 1993. Music Musician David Bowie described himself as Jungian in his relationship to dreams and the unconscious. Bowie sang of Jung on his album Aladdin, Sane Upon on Aladdin Sane, and attended the exhibition of the Red Book in New York with artist Tony Aursler, who described Bowie as reading and speaking of the psychoanalyst with passion. Bowie's 1967 song Shadow Man encapsulates a key Jungian concept, while in 1987, Bowie described the glass spiders of Never Let Me Down as Jungian mother figures around which he not only anchored a worldwide tour, but also created an enormous onstage effigy. British rock band The Police released an album titled Synchronicity in 1983. Banco de Gaia called his 2009 electronic music album Memories, Dreams, Reflections. The American rock band Tool was influenced by Jungian concepts in its album Enema, the title a play on the concepts of anima and animus. In the song 46 and 2, the singer seeks to become a more evolved self by exploring and overcoming his shadow. Argentinian musician Luis Alberto Spinetta was influenced by Jung's texts in his 1975 conceptual album Durazno Sangrando, specifically the songs Encadenado el Anima and In Una Legiana Play del Animus, which deal with anima and animus. Jung appeared on the front cover of the Beatles' Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. The South Korean band BTS 2019 album Map of the Soul, Persona is based on Jung's Map of the Soul, which gives the basic principles of Jung's analytical psychology. It includes an intro song titled Persona Wrapped by group leader Aram, who asks, Who am I? and is confronted with various versions of himself with the words Persona, Shadow, and Ego, referring to Jung's theories. On 21 February 2020, the band released Map of the Soul, Seven, which specifically focuses on Jung's shadow and ego theories. As part of the first phase of the band's comeback, interlude Shadow, wrapped by Suga and released on 10 January, addresses the shadows and the darkness that go hand in hand with the light and attention shone on celebrities. The next comeback trailer, Outro Ego, performed by J-Hope, 
ends with his declaration of self and ego as he appears within a colorful city in which the artist's current image is projected. Theater, film, television, and radio are. Federico Fellini brought to the screen exuberant imagery shaped by his encounter with Jung's ideas, especially Jungian dream interpretation. Fellini preferred Jung to Freud because Jungian analysis defined the dream not as a symptom of a disease that required a cure, but rather as a link to archetypal images shared by all of humanity. The BBC interviewed Jung for Face to Face with John Freeman at Jung's home in Zurich in 1959. Steven Seagal produced a documentary on Jung as part of his World of Dreams, Wisdom of the Dream in 1985. It was reissued in 2018. It was followed by a book of the same title. Stanley Kubrick's 1987 film Full Metal Jacket. In one scene, a colonel asks a soldier, you write born to kill on your helmet and you wear a peace button. What's that supposed to be some kind of sick joke? The soldier replies, I think I was trying to suggest something about the duality of man. Sir, the Jungian thing, sir. A dangerous method, a 2011 film directed by David Cronenberg based on Hampton's play The Talking Cure, is a fictional dramatization of Jung's life between 1904 and 1913. It mainly concerns his relationships with Freud and Sabina Spielrein, a Russian woman who became his lover and student and, later, an analyst herself. More recently, Robert Eggers' psychological thriller, The Lighthouse has elements strongly influenced by Jung's work with Eggers hoping that it's a movie where both Jung and Freud would be furiously eating their popcorn. Soul, a 2020 Pixar film written by Pete Docter, Mike Jones, and Kemp Powers, includes brief appearances of Jung as an ethereal cartoon character. In the online animated series, Super Science Friends Jung, voiced by Tom Park, is featured as one of the recurrent antagonists against Sigmund Freud. Matter of Heart 1986, documentary on the famous Swiss psychoanalyst Carl Gustav Jung, featuring interviews with those who knew him and archive footage of Jung. On 2 December 2004, BBC Radio 4's In Our Time broadcast a program on the mind and theories of Jung. Video games? The Persona series of games is heavily based on Jung's theories, as is the Knights into Dreams series of games. Xenojars for the original PlayStation and its associated works including its reimagination as the Xenosaga trilogy and a graphic novel published by the game's creator, perfect works center around Jungian concepts. Control centers around Jung's theories of the darkness and the astral plane. Jung's Labyrinth is a psychological exploration PC game that uses Jungian psychology, mythology, alchemical, and dream symbolism in a series of active imaginations to map the process of individuation. The Jungian concepts are represented mostly by the twelve archetypes that the player engages in a conversation. The game control is heavily influenced by Carl Jung's ideas, particularly synchronicity and shadow selves.